وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد وإن التفسير of سورة البلد we stopped at the ayah where Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala he said وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّجْدَيْنِ Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala he said we have shown mankind the two ways and we spoke about the word وَهَدَيْنَا and the types of guidance there are now we want to speak about the second part which is النَّجْدَيْنِ and Najadain, it means what? The two ways. So the question here is, the two ways is good and evil. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He made it clear for us the path of good and the path of evil. He made it clear to us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here I want to stop and I want to speak about a very important issue that many times is asked. A very important issue. A pertinent issue. And that is, did Allah tabarak wa ta'ala create evil? And did he create good? From the belief of Ahlul Sunnah, the Mu'taqad of Ahlul Sunnah, the belief that we have is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created good and he created evil. There are two or three points that I want to speak about and they are as follows. Number one, it is from the pillars of Al-Iman to believe in what? To believe in the Qadr. It is a pillar from the pillars of Al-Iman. And how many pillars are the Iman? Six. Six. To believe in the Qadr, the good of it and the evil of it is what? It is a pillar of Iman. Without it you have no? You have no Iman. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, Al-Imam Muslim, sorry. He's Sahih. He started with a chapter which he named it Kitabul Iman. What did he name it? Kitabul Iman. And the first hadith that he started with is what? Which one? Al Imam Muslim. Bukhari started with Inna Al-Amal Binyan. Like Al Imam Muslim, he started with the hadith of Jibreel. The famous hadith of Jibreel, right? And Al Imam Muslim narrated it from his teacher. Abu Khaythamat al-Zuhair ibn Harbin, who narrated from Waqi' ibn Jarrah al-Ru'asi, who narrated from Kahamas, who narrated from Abdullah ibn Buraida, who narrated from Yahya ibn Ya'marin. And then he mentions a story beginning before the hadith of Jibreel starts. And many people don't know this story. The story is two tabi'een, two noble tabi'een. One is his name is Yahya ibn Ya'mar. And the second one's name is Humayd ibn Abdul Rahman al Himyari. These two great Tabi'een are the students of the companions. They never met the Prophet. They are the students of the companions. So these two Tabi'een, they both were from the land Iraq. Okay, they were from where? They were from Iraq. And in Iraq, a group came out known as the Qadariya, who rejected the Qadar. And so both of these two Imams, those, those, these two great scholars, they felt the need and the desire to want to meet a companion from the companions of the Messenger. They want to tell them about what's taking place in Iraq. So they both went to either Hajj or Umrah. That's what the narration says, Hajjaini or Mu'tamiraini. Hajj or Umrah, whichever of it was. Then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala gave us the chance, they said, to meet Abdullah ibn Umar. We met him in the Kaaba. One of us sat on his right and the other one sat on his left. And Yahya ibn Ya'marin, he said, I spoke. Humayd ibn Abdul Rahman al-Himyari gave it to Yahya ibn Ya'mar. 
Yahya ibn Ya'mar spoke now. They said to him, Where we are in Iraq, a group of people have come out. They recite the Quran and they seek knowledge. They pursue the path of knowledge. But they claim Allah Qadr that there is no Qadr. And issues have just happened. Abdullah ibn Umar, upon hearing that, he said, straight away, فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنِّي بَرِئُ مِنْهُمْ Inform them that I have nothing to do with them. وَأَنَّهُمْ بُرَعَاءُ مِنِّي And they are free from me. I have nothing to do with them. That's the first thing he said. أَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنِّي بَرِئُ مِنْهُمْ وَأَنَّهُمْ بُرَعَاءُ مِنِّي And then Abdullah ibn Umar swore by Allah. He said, Wallahi, law anfaqa ahadihim mithla uhudin dhahaba. If one of them was to give the mountain of uhud of gold, ma qabila Allahu minhum, Allah will not accept it from them, hatta yu'mina bil qadari, until he believes in the qadar. Mountain of uhud of gold, if he gives it, Allah won't accept it from him, that sadaqah, unless he believes in the qadar, the good of it and the evil of it. And then he mentioned the story of his father. He said, I heard my father say, Umar ibn al-Khattab بينما نحن جلوس عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات يوم اطلع علينا رجل شديد بياض الثياب شديد سواد الشعر لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرف منا أحد حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبتي إلى ركبتي ووضع كفي على فخذي وقال يا محمد أخبرني عن الإسلام أن لي تولي الفايف بيلز في الإسلام قال صدقت فعجبنا له يسأل ويصدق قال فأخبرني عن الإيمان قال أنت تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر تؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره قال صدقت قال فعجبنا قال قال فأخبرنا عن الإحسان قال أنت عبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك قال فأخبرني عن أمراتها قال أن تلد الأمة ربتها وأن ترى الحفاة العراة العالة رعاء الشاء يتطاولون في البنيان ثم انطلق فلبثت مليا ثم جاء ثم قال يا عمر أتدري من السائل قلت الله ورسوله أعلم قال فإنه جبريل أتاكم يعلمكم دينكم The point I want from the hadith is that when the Prophet asked, uh, Jibreel asked the Prophet وسلم, about Iman, what did he tell him? That Iman is how many pillars? So that's the first point I want us to understand. That the Qadr is a pillar of the Iman and without it you are not a believer. You have to believe in it. The second point that I want to speak about is, the second point, the Qadr stands on four pillars. The Qadr, what does it stand on? It stands on four pillars. Again, the Qadr stands on how many pillars, brothers? It stands on four pillars. The first of them is al-ilm, knowledge. Allah knows everything. And the scholars, they say, alima ma kana, Allah knows what was. Wa ma sayakunu, and that which will happen. Wa ma kana, and that which is. Ama wa ma huwa kainun, and whatever is. Allah knows what's happened. Allah knows what is happening. Allah knows what's going to happen and Allah even knows what hasn't happened. If it was to happen the way it would happen. That's the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the evidence for that is وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا إِلَّا هُوْ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ أَرْضٍ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Allah knows all of that. All of that is his infinite knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is Everything to Allah wa ta'ala is written. The qadr, whatever is going to happen is written. And what the, the writing is five writings. How many writings are there? There are five. We won't go into that, that's another discussion. The third thing that we have to believe, the first stage, the third stage, sorry, of the qadr is what? al mashia al mashia means a will. Allah has a will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah said in the ayah, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ And the fourth one is خَلْق Allah created. Allah created وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah created you and whatever you do. All of it, He created it. Our actions are created by Allah Azza wa we are created by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Whatever is taking place is created. And then the last one is what I want to focus on, which is the good and the evil is what? It is created by who? Who is it created by? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third point that I want to speak about is 
the evil that we see taking place in the world today some people are they say if Allah is more, if Allah is the most merciful the most gracious why do we see suffering why do we see pain why do we see this why do we see that and that means there is this goes against Allah is the most merciful the scholars Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in his kitab Shifa al-Adil he says الشر في القدر ليس باعتبار تقدير الله له وإنما باعتبار المقدور له he says something very powerful he says that the evil that is in the qadr it is not the qadr it's the create Allah making the qadr the evil that you're seeing is not inside Allah making this qadr but rather it is evil for whoever it's happening to and I give an example of what that means fire is fire evil fire it depends on what it does if you cook food with the fire what is it it's good and if it burns a, pe a person it is what it's evil are we all together and every single thing that you see around you there's no evil in the cre Allah making that issue but it is whatever when it comes into contact with something the evil can come from there when it comes to contact with something the fire is not evil but it came into contact with somebody's body and it burnt that person now it's evil but that same fire if it was to cook you food it's a what it's a good thing are we all together brothers Abi Hamid al Ghazali, he says, If there was no crookedness in the bow, the arrow would not have gone out. <coughs> crookedness is not a good thing, is it? But the arrow for it to go to its target straight, the bow has to be crooked. So? And the third point that I want to mention now looking at the Quran and the Sunnah. Looking at the Quran and the Quran and the Sunnah, when we see the Quran and the Sunnah, the way that the evil is spoken about, um, the way that the evil is addressed in the Quran and the Sunnah is three stages, it's three steps. This is the last point that I want you to take on board, inshaAllah ta'ala. The evil when it's mentioned, it's mentioned with the other creations of Allah Azza wa Jalla. The evil is mentioned, but it's mentioned with the other creation. Like the evidence that I brought you, and yudhkar al sharr the evil is mentioned with the other creations of Allah Azza wa For example, Allah says, Allahu khaliqu kulli shayin. Allah is the creator of everything. So the evil is in there. It's with the other creation. Ama, wallahu khalaqakum. Allah created you, wa ma ta'amaluna, and, and that which you do. Good or bad, it doesn't matter, all of it together. The second way that the evil is mentioned in the Quran, the evil uh, that happens is, the evil is attributed to its reason the evil is mentioned with its reason mentioned with its reason like Allah did in Surah Al-Falaq and the Surah goes on it's mentioned, the evil is now stipulated with what's causing it and the reason for it the third one which is that the evil is mentioned the one who did it is hidden it's not mentioned who did it and we know as we just said right now who's the one who does who created the good and the evil Allah Azza wa Jalla but then it's still not attributed to him subhanahu wa ta'ala you will never find in the Quran the evil being directly attributed to Allah Azza wa Jalla you all know the the, the jinns the Muslim jinns what did they say? وَأَنَّا لَا نَدْرِي أَشَرٌ أُرِيدَ أُرِيدَ مَفْعُولُ الَّذِي لَمْ يُسَمَّ فَاعِلُهُ The subject is hidden here. أُرِيدَ It was intended for us. They didn't say Allah intended it for us. Are you with me? Um, you know the story of Surah Khadir when he went onto the boat and he, he punched a hole inside the boat, right? Did he not? Did he not? Khadir and Musa was shocked. What are, you, what are you doing? What did he say? Khadir, when he brought, when he pierced it, and he explained it later. 
He said, وَأَمَّا السَّفِينَةُ فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ فِي الْبَحْرِ فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا I wanted to make a fault out of it, not Allah. What about when it came to the building of the uh, Khadirs himself? When it came to building the wall that was about to fall, what did he say? فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشْهُدَّهُمَا Allah intended for the wall to stand. So the good of building that wall for the family, the orphans, he attributed that to Allah because it's good. But when it came to faulting the ship, he attributed to whom? Who? Himself. Nabiullah Ibrahim, what, what did he say about Allah wa Taala? He says, "Alladhi khalaqani, fahuwa yahdin. Walladhi huwa yutamuni, wa yasqin. Wa idha maritu, who did he attribute to the sickness to?" The food, who did he attribute it to Allah? The drinking and the sustenance, he attributed it to Allah. The guidance, he attributed it to Allah. The creating, he attributed it to Allah. But when it came to the sickness and the illness, who did he attribute it to? Huh? He attributed it to himself. And then how can we then find Muslims who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who love to attribute evil to Allah? These are the righteous people. And they had ta'addub and manners with Allah azza wa jalla. They didn't attribute it to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the scholars they say, Can anyone encompass Allah's knowledge? Can anyone encompass Allah's knowledge? Anyone who thinks he's knowledgeable, Allah is always the same way that you cannot comprehend and you cannot fully understand and have knowledge more than Allah, you also cannot understand the wisdom of his actions. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are things he does that you will never come to understand. Are we all together, brothers? One of the things that Shaykh Muhammad Musa al-Uthaymi rahimahullah said, which is very powerful, he said, the sun, as we know in the authentic hadith, the sun before it rises, sun before it rises, every morning, who does it take permission from? It takes permission from Allah, the sun does. Before it what? Before it comes out. And the permission that it takes from its Lord is, shall I come out like an ordinary day? Or is the hour come? And Allah says, no, come out as normal. And he does that every morning until the day of judgment where Allah says, come out from the opposite direction. The question here is, if the sun comes out for this country, but it's already out for another country, we couldn't even understand the sun and the way it works. How are we going to understand Allah? We couldn't even understand a creation that Allah created. How do we then want to understand and fully comprehend what? Allah, we won't be able to understand everything. But the truth is, we have to understand Everybody needs to work towards what's good for him. Everyone needs to strive and come with effort and hard work. Allah wa ta'ala, he says, we have shown him the two ways. Both paths were clarified for you and we spoke about that previously. And then Allah wa ta'ala, he says, it means here is a question and some of the Mufassirin they took another path which is but he has not broken through the difficult path I'm at the difficult path there's that tight path that the believer has to squeeze through and he has to break through it Allah says, Why not does the creation, why do we not break through that, that pass? And then Allah asks a question. He says, Allah says, And what can you make? What can you make? What can make you know? What is the breaking through difficult path? Is a question. What can make you know and understand? Mal'aqaba, ay maktihamul aqaba. The mudaf here is mahduf min babi hadfil mudaf. The mudaf is removed, which is aqaba that was taken out. Now you're thinking to yourself, what is aqaba? The breakthrough pass. What does it mean? Allah tells us here, He says, fakuraqaba. This part, breaking through pass that we need to break through is the following things. The first one is فَكُرَقَبَ 
And fakku raqaba here is a khabar. Khabar for what? It's a khabar for wa ma adraka ma al-aqaba. Am iqtihamu al-aqaba. Iqtihamu al-aqaba. Fakku raqaba is the khabar, is the pre predict. I think it's called in English. I'm predicate, right? I'm a predicate. Uh, the jumla ismiya, the normative sentence in the Arabic language consists of two things. It consists of a what? A subject and a, a predicate. The subject is the mubtadi, mubtada and the second one is it's the khabar. There has to be mubtada and there has to be a khabar. The mubtada we already have which is iqtiham al-aqaba. The khabar here is fa ku ku ku. There's a, there's a raf on there which is that it's the khabar. So now here it's telling us what it means iqtihamul aqaba the breaking through past what does it mean fakuraqaba it means to free a neck to free someone righteous actions are now going to be mentioned it is to free a slave this is something very hard on people something you own to let it go fakuraqaba it is to free a neck ama a slave to free it أو أو إطعام في يوم ذي مسغبة أو feeding on a day of severe hunger a day when you're really hungry and you want it for yourself what do you do you give it to someone else and remember this is the time the person's nobility and generosity really shows I'll tell you a story that is authentically attributed to the uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that is the story of a man. This man's story is that a group of guests, um, a guest came to his house. A guest came and visited his house, and he had nothing. He did not have, he did not have anything to give to the guest that came, except the food that he had for his children. That's what he had. And so he came to his wife and he said to his wife, I only have food that only one person can eat. It was for my children. If the guest comes, he's going he's gonna to want to eat with me. And he's not going to let me just say, eat by yourself. And so what he did to me, he said is, when I bring the food to him, itfa is siraja, extinguish the fire, get rid of the candle, blow it out. So it's pitch dark. And so he did that. The room became dark. He pushed the food to the guest. He never ate anything. And he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah. Let him stand up, don't worry. He pushed and he pushed the food for the guest. The guest ate and ate. He's thinking the other man is eating with him because it's a pitch dark room. And the man slept nicely because he ate what he wanted. And he and his wife and his children slept that night with no food or nothing. In the morning when they came to the masjid, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned around after the prayer and he said to the man, Inna Allah ajaba min sani'atikum al-layla. Allah was fascinated with you, you and your wife's doing last night. And the ayah came down regarding their affairs. وَمَنْ يُوقَشُ حَنَفْسِهِ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ صح? What does it mean? He's stingy to his nafs. He has shuh. He doesn't give it to himself. He prioritizes another person. He says, you know what, you take it. This is his own child's food. He wanted to get, take care of the guest. Oh, it'amun. To provide and to give. Fi yawmin a day. The mazgaba. When the hunger is very high. This is the, this is the iqtiham al-aqaba the breaking through that people need to do in their life this is the real and ultimate achievement also also to uh, take care of an orphan who is what the maqarabatin who's a rel who's, who's a relative who has near relationship with you you see the Sadaqah and the good doing that is done for the rest of the people is just a sadaqah, which is a great station. But the sadaqah you do for your family members is even more higher. The Messenger ﷺ, he said in the hadith, 
As-sadaqatu ala al-miskini sadaqah. The sadaqah that you do for the poor and the ones in need, it's a sadaqah. Wa hiya ala dhirrahini. And for the relative, it is what? Thintani two. Sadaqatun wasilatun. It is sadaqah and it's also ties of kinship that you're keeping. You're coming with two rewards because of the ayah that we were instructed, Allah said in the Quran, فَهَلْ عَصَيْتُمْ إِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَنْ تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُ أَرْحَامَكُمْ You can't cut the ties of kinship. You're keeping the ties of kinship. وَلِذَلِكَ You will know the issue of the qaraba and the ties of kinship. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He said to the rahim, اشتقتُ I, I derived and extracted a name for you from my name. Allah's name is Ar-Rahman, right? Rahma. Rahim came from that root word. And then look what Allah said to the Rahim. Allah they said, فَمَنْ وَصَلَكَ وَصَلَنِي Anyone who keeps her, keeps connected with you, is keeps connected with connection with me. And anyone who disconnects you has disconnected me. So if you have family relatives, try to keep the sila. Know about their well-being and how they are. O miskinan or a poor. Da matarabatin. A miskin that is da mataraba. What does it mean da mataraba? Da mataraba means a person of the sand. What does it mean sand? It means a person, a miskin that is excessively hungry. That hunger has reached a point where he's lying down on the earth and he can't get off the sand. The word mataraba comes from the word turab. الذي لصق بالأرض من شدة الفاقة. His stomach and his body has connected to the earth, and due to hunger he can't stand up. You've given it to him. He's become like that. And what we need to understand is two things. Number one, what is the difference between the fakir and the miskin? Is there a difference between faqir and miskin? Yes, there is. The faqir is الَّذِي لَا يَجِدُ شَيْئًا أَوْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا The faqir is the one who can't find anything. Or even if he finds it, it's something very petty. Nothing, he, he can't get anything. He's faqir. The miskin, on the other hand, is الَّذِي يَجِدُ شَيْئًا he finds something. Well, I agree, but it's not enough for him. It is not. It's not enough. And the evidence that the miskin is the one who has something, but it's not enough, is the eye of Allah. They are miskin and they work on the ocean, they, they have business. Do you see? So the miskin has a job. He might, he might work. But he's what? He does not have enough. Whatever he's making is always less. He's minus. He's what? He's minus. He can't make ends meet. But remember the word al faqir and al miskin. It's from the terms that the scholars mention That they can interchangeably be used Like what's here right now in this ayah Oh miskin and da mataraba Because miskin da mataraba means the, oh, He doesn't have anything he doesn't work, He's on the floor So the miskin here means faqir as well It's interchangeably used But if they're both mentioned in the same context Then miskin something means something and then faqir means something else. Does that make sense? That's the first point that I want us to all know. And the next point I want us to all know, brothers, is some of us, Allah has blessed us with money and when we have a life, a happiness, we have wealth. What we need to understand is this that Allah has given us, we only get it. And it was only given to us because of these weak people who are in need that we're helping. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, and Imam Al-Bukhari narrated, the Prophet said, هَلْ تُنْصَرُونَ وَتُرْزَقُونَ إِلَّا بِضُعَفَائِكُمْ Is Allah giving you victory? Uh, is Allah giving you victory? 
And is Allah giving you provision except because of the weak? You're only getting the victory and the good that you're looking for. And you're only getting the uh, risk and the provision that you're getting because of the weak ones that you're taking care of and you're aiding and you're supporting. Are we all together, brothers? This is why you get it. The du'afa and the weak ones is where Allah is aiding us. We're giving, Allah is bringing more in for us. We're giving, Allah is bringing more for us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Al-Imam al-Nasai wa narrated, إِنَّمَا يُنصَرُ اللَّهُ Allah gives victory. هذه الأمة, this أمة, بضعيفها, because of its the du'afa. Allah gives victory to this أمة because of their weak ones. بِدَعْوَتِهِمْ Because of their supplication for you. وَصَلَاتِهِمْ And their prayer. وَإِخْلَاصِهِمْ And their sincerity. These masakeen, we don't have anything. That you gave them something. Through them Allah is going to, they're going to supplicate you for you. And they're going to pray for you. And their sincerity and Allah is going to give you subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Dharrin, he came to the messenger. This hadith is found in Bukhari and Muslim. He came to the messenger and he said, أَيُّ الْعَمَلِ أَفْضَلْ, أفضل. What is the best action that I can do? What is the best action that I can do? And the messenger mentioned a couple of actions. And from the actions that the messenger mentioned is and to ina sani'an. That you help a laborer. You help a laborer, a person who's working. You go and you help him. He's in the, he's in the furnace. He's making bread. You're, go, you're going by. Go and turn and help him. Make a couple of breads with him. You see him carry something heavy on his body back. He's working. Take some of the pressure off him. Help him in it. And to ina sani'an. Because it encourages him. Also, how can you help him as well? When he gives you back the money. Because he's working. He's not begging. And this is what the, the religion of Islam wants. He wants to reduce the ones who are begging. And the ones who are working is... So what do you do? You tell him, keep the change. Tell him, keep the change. Don't, I don't want it. You keep it. This is aiding him and supporting him to stay away from begging the people because this is what Allah brought him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to ina sani'an that you aid and you support a laborer. Aw tasna'u li akhraqa and you also what? You work for one who's disabled. He's got autism. He's got an illness. Work for him. Make it your job to serve him. If Allah has given you money now, Spend it on him. Get someone, even if he's not your child, if somebody else, do this. It's one of the greatest actions of Allah. One of the greatest actions. It is one of the, one of the greatest actions that a person can do, which is to help the one who is disabled. The one who is disabled. And Allah is testing us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's testing us who have the ability. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to? What are we going to do about this? How are we going to take care of our brothers and sisters? Remember, brothers, this money that you have isn't really yours. It's a risk Allah, something He gave you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's what Allah gave you. And Allah wants to see what are you going to do with what He gave you. And look how merciful He is. What He has given you, which is His, He gave it to you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's looking at what you're going to do with it and He wants to reward you for it and give you more. It doesn't reduce your wealth. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to nurture his household, this concept of giving. One day the Messenger came back to the house, to his wife Aisha, and he said, Oh Aisha, the food that was brought, what remains from it? The wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they got something, it was always dispersed, it was dispersed and it was given out and it was shared with the neighbors. That's how the Prophet's household was, Ali Sallallahu So he wanted to know if he made it in time before it was all given out. And he said, oh Aisha, what's left? And she said, a shoulder. And the reason why she left the shoulder behind is because she knew that the Prophet loved the shoulder, alayhi salatu wasalam. He used to love the shoulder. And he corrected her. He said, no Aisha, everything else is left except the shoulder. Shoulder is what we're going to eat, we're going to take it. It's not, it's not us, it's not left over. What is left is what we gave for the sake of Allah. How he's correcting and he's nurturing his family on this concept of giving. On the concept of given. And then Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala He says ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And then being among these 
I'm a being among those are those who believe. وَتَوَاصَوْ sabri, And they advise one another to be patient. وَتَوَاصَوْ marhama, And they advise one another to compassion. Question. It mentions here, ثُمَّ كَانَ And then from amongst them are. Ponder here. This is very tricky point. And I want you guys to answer it, inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah just mentioned the freeing of a slave. Did He not? Did Allah not just mention the freeing of a slave? Sahih He did. He also mentioned giving food to the, to the needy, especially at the time of hunger. And also taking care of a, a, a near relationship orphan, a relative from amongst your relatives, an orphan. And also the poor. After that Allah says, they believe. It's as though the righteous deed came and they didn't have Iman and the Iman was mentioned after. Does that make sense? ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا After that from amongst them were believers. It seems as though, and it comes across as though, the people who were doing this were not believers. Because the Iman is a prerequisite for any righteous actions. If you don't have Iman, however much good you do, it won't be accepted. Are we all together? If a non-Muslim gives sadaqah, he takes care of the needy, and he gives charity, does he get rewarded for it? Yes, he does. He does get rewarded for it. He gets rewarded in his dunya. In his dunya, Allah gives him. Allah doesn't oppress. What he did is good. But he won't get anything for the what? Why? Because for it to be accepted from you is what? What's the condition? Al Iman. Iman is a condition. It's a sharp. It's a condition. He doesn't have it. So, how do you reconcile between the ayat saying that and then there were believers amongst them instead of the believers being the ones who do all of these righteous actions? This is what should have been. The scholars, they have four responses. The first one is that the thumma is لِلْتَرْتِيبِ فِي الذِّكْرِ لَا لِلْتَرْتِيبِ فِي الزَّمَنِ It's a... The order and the sequence here is just by mention. It's not by timing. That they did these righteous actions and then they came with Iman. It doesn't mean that. Rather, the thumma here is like the wow. Does the wow show order? Does it show sequence? Does the wow in the Arabic language, the wow. Dakhala Zaydun, Zayd entered. Wa Amr, and Amr entered. Does it show you which one entered first? Dakhala Zaydun, Zayd entered. Wa Amr, Amr entered. Does it show you which one entered first? Huh? No, it doesn't. The wow doesn't in the Arabic language. It doesn't show you tartib or taqib. The wow doesn't. Like in thumma does, right? The thumma in this ayah, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the wow. It's like what Allah said, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَ لَهَا سَعْيَهَا إِشْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ Oh, mu'min was mentioned after. Before that was mentioned, striving for the hereafter. And then they were believers. No, no, the wow here doesn't show order. They were always believers when they were striving for the hereafter. Are we all together? Are we all together? So the wow here, sorry, the thumma here doesn't show the sequence. It's not showing that sequence. That's the first response. The second response is that it does show sequence. Oh, and it does show order. But it means that they did this righteous action and they died upon Iman. Are we all together, brothers? And they died upon Iman. Meaning, they were believers when they were doing this righteous action, but the reason why Iman was mentioned last is because they died upon this faith and this belief. Because the reality is, إِنَّمَا amal bil That all of the good that you're doing, it doesn't really matter if you don't die upon what? 
Iman. Because a person can give sadaqah and he can look after the poor and he can take care of them. And he, and he can do that all as a Muslim. But if he leaves the religion the last moment of his life, it doesn't really matter now. Sah? So they said that the sequence here is right. It's no problem. It just means that they died with belief of Allah Azza wa The third response is a group of scholars who said, yeah, we believe it's, it shows that the Iman came later. It was a group of people who did good before Islam. They did good before what? Islam. They freed the slaves. They took care of the, the needy and the poor. They did this all before Islam. And then when they came into Islam, all of the good came with them. And that's the view of some of the scholars who hold that if you've done good before Islam and you repent and you come to Islam and you proclaim faith and iman of Allah Azza wa that all of the good that you did comes and all of the evil is what? Eradicated. It's nullified. Are we all together? How merciful Allah is. All of the good that he did is and all of the wrongdoings, they all are nullified. That's the three. And the fourth one is a homework for you guys to find out, inshallah ta'ala. The fourth is for you guys to find out what's the fourth response. Allah says here, ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا From the believers, there were those who what? وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ They commanded each other what? And they advised one another what? Patience. The believer, this is their characteristics. When they meet each other and they see a person who's struggling in life, a person who's going through stress, anxiety, depression, the advice that he gives him, he says, As-sabru, patience. You all know the famous hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came on a woman who was crying on top of a grave. She was weeping. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Isbiri wahtasibi, Be patient and hope reward from Allah Azza wa Jalla. The woman was looking down, she didn't look up. And then she said, Da'ani, leave me alone. For what I am going through, you did not, you, you did not, you're not feeling my pain. It's easy for you to say, as some say today. Yeah? That's what they say, right? And so what did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Did he shout at her? But Wallahi, we can learn a lot of akhlaq from the Messenger Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah. He could have said, arrest her. Get, put a... He walked by, he just left her. He left her, the way she is. She came back, she realized the people told her, did you know who you just spoke back to? She said, who? She said, they spoke, you spoke back to the Prophet She couldn't hold herself. So she ran to the Prophet's house And look what the hadith says. She did not find Bawab, security guard, blocking her, the Prophet's door. There was no security guard guarding the Prophet's door. And the scholars, they said, this came, this happened after the ayah came down. Ya ayyuhar rasoolu balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik wa illam taf'al fama ballaghta risalat wallahu ya'asimuka min al-nas. Allah is going to save you from the people. Don't worry. Before he used to have some companions who would stand at his door and protect him, alayhi salatu. He used to have that. But from this ayah when it came down, he didn't have a security guard. So she came and she entered upon the messenger and said, oh, Rasulullah, I didn't know it was you. And she pleaded. And so the Prophet told her, Alayhi Patience is when? The first moments that you are afflicted with the calamity. It's no benefit if you cry, if you say, Yeah, I'm going to be patient two, three days later. It, you ha the patience should come out when? As soon as you go through it. Because this is the hardest time. And what does patience mean? Something people think. That it does, it means that you can't cry, you can't feel sad. That's fine, that's all fine. That's actually natural to feel that way. It's all natural. Allah said about the Messenger, Muhammad, we know that what the people are saying about you and the criticism and the <coughs> accusation and the allegations that they are throwing at you, we know that it makes you feel uncomfortable. The way it makes you feel we know Muhammad this is Rasulullah so it's natural that you feel this way but it doesn't you don't show vulgar statements you don't speak in a in, in, in a, a despicable manner 
you don't become unscrupulous and unethical. You keep up to the way that the religion wants for you. You cry and you always know that everything that happens to you in this world, it was because of Allah Ta'ala's Mashi'ah, His will, Alayhi Azza wa Jalla. وَتَوَاسَوْ marhama. The believers also, they advise one another what? Compassion. Brothers, compassion is a sifa, aliya, a noble characteristics. The ayah is telling you, وَتَوَاسَوْ marhama. To be compassionate and to be merciful is a sifa, a noble characteristics. Some people today, وَلِلْأَسَفِ shadid. It's really sad that they try to get closer to Allah by always being harsh to the Muslims. Are we all together? That's the, it's become their way in life. That's what they think that the, 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 the way of the Messenger وسلم, was. Anyone who comes in front of you, insult him. Call him a name. Foul language. That's, the, that's, that's what they think that they're protecting the religion with. And the Messenger وسلم, he, what did he tell us? He told us, that gentleness is never taken from something except it makes it ugly. Rasulullah is saying this. When Allah told us that He sent the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did He say? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِيش؟ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَبِيَ اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدٌ وَالسَّنَ أَزَوَاتُ أَزَمَ مَسِي مَسِي you know, do you all know, have you read the biography of the Prophet that when he وسلم, was leaving Mecca, remember when he was leaving Mecca, what was he? He was a prophet of Allah. Did Quraysh like him? Some of Quraysh's properties were still under the Prophet's guardianship. He, they gave it to him. They told him to, they've entrusted him with it. They, he was holding it for them. And he, before he left Mecca, what did he do? He gave back every single body's what? Their properties that they owned. Keeping in mind that some of them were holding on to some of the properties of the Muslims. And they took it from them. Alayhi salatu Are you with me? Brothers, are you with me? They really knew mercy in the Prophet sallallahu the son of Abu Jahl. <coughs> when he went onto the ocean and they threw the idols off from the ocean, when they went into the middle of the ocean, he wanted to run away from the Prophet ﷺ after the Prophet opened the conquest of Mecca. Ikrimah ran away. Remember, he was one of the people who rebelled against the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. He tried to fight the Prophet in Mecca and then he ran away when the Prophet's force and army took over Mecca. Khalid ibn Walid fought him. And that's why some blood was shed in the Kaaba, in Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was the only person who was allowed to fight in Mecca, and I was only allowed to fight in Mecca. We spoke about it at the beginning of the surah for a short period of time, and no one after me is allowed to fight in Mecca. Anyways, anyways, what happened was the uh, Ikrimah ran away and he went to Yemen. And the boat it broke down in the middle of the sea. And the people they threw out the idols and they started calling on to Allah. And he said, what are you guys doing? He realized, وَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ دِينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ That they beg, on, they beg Allah Azza wa Jalla in the times of ease and the times of hardship, they forget Him. And he said, a God that can't help me at a time of hardship when I really needed Him. I don't really need Him at times of ease. He said, I need to go to Muhammad. Wallah, if he's a prophet from Allah, he will not. He will not close his doors on me. He will open his hands for me. Are we all together? That's what it was. And remember, Ikrama, there was a death sentence on him, meaning there was a death, a warrant on his head. He came onto the Prophet Are we all together, brothers? You all know the story of Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Sarh. Abdullah ibn Sarhin. When he entered upon the Prophet ﷺ, and this is the man who insulted the Prophet, made poetry about the Prophet's wives, and the Prophet commanded him to be executed. And he entered upon the Prophet. And guess who brought him in? Who brought him to the Prophet? 
Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman and Abdullah ibn Salihin were related. So he brought him to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I buy you. Give him Pledge of Allegiance. The Prophet turned away, he didn't want to. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he turned away, he went and he stuck his hand out again. The Prophet turned away. And then he turned away too many times. And the Prophet finally gave his hand and he gave him a pledge of allegiance. When the man left, the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, Why did not any one of you stand up and execute this man? I remember I told you what to do to him. Death sentence. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, why didn't you wink? Sahabas, they said that, Ya Rasulullah, why didn't you wink and tell us we would have dealt with this? And then he said, it is not befitting for a prophet to have an eye of deceit. I cannot deceive. That day onwards, that companion, that man was allowed to what? Roam around where he wanted. No one can touch him now because the prophet gave him a pledge of allegiance. Are you with me, brothers? The point I want to get from the story is, they knew the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and what did they know him as? A merciful creation from Allah, from Allah's creations. He was very merciful. In all aspects, when you look at the Prophet's life, Wallah, you'll be fascinated. In that time, brothers, there wasn't a human right that took care of the human. He was Sallallahu Alaihi the haywan, the animals. There wasn't animal rights activists. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, put that all in, in, in context for us. He was truly merciful. But that doesn't mean, brothers, that the Prophet ﷺ wasn't also what? Harsh in its places. When the time called for it, he وسلم, dealt with whatever needed to be dealt with. He did sallallahu alayhi those people who come with iman, who advise one another with patience, who advise each other with compassion, Allah says, Ula'ika ashabul maymana. These are the people and the companions of the right. The ones who their books would be given to them in their rights. These are the people of obedience. These are the people of Jannah. Al Jannah. That's just, this is who they are. Also, what do you, you take from the ayah, brothers? Iman is not just a claim. I'm a mu'min. I'm a believer. My father's name is Abdullah. My name is Khalid. I'm a believer. Jannah is. That's not. Islam is a religion that you need to work for yourself. Christianity, they believe what? Jesus got crucified, he took the sin of all mankind, you just have to believe in the crucifixion, crucifixion and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Like, we don't believe that. Everyone has to work. Everyone has to come with hard work and effort. Sorry, that's the reality. The last uh, two ayahs, Allah wa Taala says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Those who disbelieve. Bi ayatina they disbelieve in our verses. They disbelieve in our verses. <coughs> what do they believe? Disbelieve in the book. The verses here is the two types of verses. The ayat are two types. Ayat kauniya and the ayat shariya. So the atheists will fall under this. Why? Because they believe disbelieved in the what? The universal signs. Who created them? Who created this universe that we're in? And who created us? Allah Azza wa Jalla, He is the one who's cre who created us. They disbelieve in all of that. They also disbelieve in the ayat of Sharia, the Quran and the Sunnah. They disbelieve in it. Ulaika, those ones are Ashabul Mash'ama. Ashabul Mash'ama, what does it mean? Two views. And they both mean the same. Ashabul Shu'mi, a people of evilness. Evil people. And the other one is Ashabul Mash'ama means a Ahlul Shimali, they are the people of the left. In the Ahlul Nar. Both of them mean the same. It either comes from the word shum or shimal. Evil, evil doers. Or they are people of the left. That's what they are. They're going to be from the people of the hellfire, the day of judgment. Walladina kafaru, those who disbelieve. Bi ayatina our verses. Whom they are ashabul mash'ama. They are the people of the hellfire. The dwellers of the hellfire. That's where they will be in. Alayhim upon them is narum mu'sada. A fire which is closed in, it's closed on them, no way to go. They're going to be destroyed inside there. This is what Allah ordained for them, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because why? They did the ultimate sin. The ultimate sin, which is to disbelieve in Allah Azza wa Jalla. This deserves eternal punishment. 
eternal punishment. We'll finish there, inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, shaitan. And Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah, subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfiru wa tubu